Hello folks, it's good to be with you on this Wednesday evening devotional time together. I'm glad that you're here with us and uh, so pleased to be able to bring a lesson to you tonight uh, that I think will help us in some ways uh, because of some of the things that are going on today. The lesson title is Don't Be Anxious or maybe more appropriately uh, titled Don't Worry, Be Happy. Uh, all the things that are going on around us with the the various things that we've been through over the last year, uh, today with with riots and and the elections and and all these various things uh, can deeply affect us. And so, as we've been talking about this being a a new year with new opportunities and and new things before us, I thought it might be good to really remind us: don't worry, don't worry about it. God's got this; He's in control. And so. Don't be anxious, don't worry, be happy. Uh, you know, there's the, the song, I'm not going to sing it for you, uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate that, but that it's entitled, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Don't worry about a thing. Everything's going to be all right. And if we really put our trust and faith in God, we can see that everything will be all right in the end. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 24. And here is a passage where Jesus is teaching the people about really what's important in life and what's not. And so there in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Do not be anxious. And I've underlined the times that Jesus uses this, this same phrase do not be anxious or do not worry. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink or about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, how they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious? about your clothing. Uh, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you that Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the, the Gentiles, they seek after these things. But your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Verse 33 is the key. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. There's a lot of things here that we need to break down a little bit, but... I want you to understand that, number one, life is more than material things. Life does not consist of the abundance of the things that we possess. Worldly measures, uh, the, the world measures success by how much stuff we have. We live in a time where, where we have a lot of things. In our country, in the world that we live in today, we have a lot of stuff. Maybe even a lot of junk. The world measures success by how much material goods you have? How much money do you have in the bank? How big is your house? How many cars and vehicles do you own? How, how much stock portfolio is, is in your name? The world measures success by those accomplishments. But God looks at something different. A fellow Christian once wrote a book entitled, How to Be a Faithful Christian Even Though You Are a Success. And I would say that the person who is a faithful Christian is a success. You see, God looks at success differently than the world does. Think about the, the parable, or actually the, the illustration that Jesus points out of the widow as she's there going up to the, the treasury box there in the temple, and he, he's there with his apostles, and he says, look at this, this widow. She's giving the last two mites, the last, last little bit of money that she has, she gave it to the Lord. It wasn't much materially, it may not have been able to go and do a lot of grand things in the temple with that, that little amount, but she gave from the heart. And so life is more than material things. And faithfulness is something that God truly sees as a 
wonderful accomplishment, ultimately giving us a, a great reward. How much wealth can be accumulated? How much political power can be amassed? We've seen all sorts of political ads, and you've been bombarded, and Georgia has set a record for uh, the amount of money that's been spent on political campaigns this year. But was it really that big a deal in the scheme of things? Is it going to help anybody get to heaven? Is it going to impact drastically the world around us? It may make some difference, uh, whichever way you look at things. But is it going to make an eternal difference? I think not. And so, how much recognition can we gain? How much popularity can we get? You know, entertainers sometimes even seek out, uh, you know, they maybe they go through a slump where they haven't been getting uh, very many callbacks to, to be in movies or whatever. And so they go out and do something really stupid so that they can get their name out in the, the papers and in the public and, and on the, uh, the, the paparazzi's watch list. And so sometimes the, the phrase is used, uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Uh, even the negative kind can still work to the benefit of the individual. When we think about all those things, does it really matter when you're dead and lying in a casket? What about, for example, Michael Jackson? You know, he was considered the king of pop music and certainly world famous and amassed a great wealth. But is it going to help him now in, in, in eternity? No, I think not. The same thing could be said for any one of us. If we go out seeking material goods and we're not laying up treasures in heaven and focusing on what's really important, it will all be for nothing. So sometimes we worry about the wrong things. We also see that we're more valuable here in this passage than the birds and the flowers and the grass. There may be some groups out there that would tell you that animals are far more valuable than humans, but what God says is that we are more valuable than they and... God the Father is watching over us. God takes care of them, so you know that he will take care of you. We can rely on that. Look there at verses 26 through 31. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow nor reap or, or gather into barns, and yet God feeds them. You know, the lilies of the field, how they, they grow. God takes care of that in his infinite wisdom. And Yeah, we've got some learning that we've done in the, the most recent years on scientifically how it happens photosynthesis and the lilies and, and, you know, they're soaking in the sunlight and the water and all these things that we've learned, and yet God created it just by speaking. And God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow just becomes fuel in the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? How quickly we lose our center. And we begin to, to worry about the things around us in this way or that way, and, and, and we lose our focus. What's really important in life? Being anxious or worrying is futile. It, in fact, it's counterproductive. It's a waste of time and shouldn't be a part of the Christian's life. You see, many times we just focus and fixate on things that, that we really can't affect one way or the other. We worry about a lot of things, and yet... God the Father is really the only one that can truly affect change in many things that we worry about. In Matthew 6 and verse 27, he says, Which of you, by being anxious or worrying a lot, can add a single hour to his lifespan? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is none of us can. And so worrying about it really will not affect positively our life and the length that we might live. In fact, we'll look at some things here in a moment that says that the opposite, that we can worry to the point of shortening our life. There's a uh, short poem, I guess it's called, that says, Worry never climbed a hill, never paid a bill, never dried a tear, never calmed a fear. Worry never darned a heel, worry never cooked a meal, worry never composed a song. Actually, worry never did a worthwhile thing all along. Worry doesn't accomplish anything for us. In fact, it, it operates in the opposite. And so sometimes we just need to step back and say, Lord, I need you to be in control. Anxiety or worry is not only futile, but it can be physically harmful to the body. You, know, you think about uh, the blood pressure and, and stomach effects of, of having acid reflux or all sorts of things that are 
side effects of stress or worry. Dr. Charles Mayo, who founded the Mayo Clinic, said, I've never known a man to die from hard work, but many who have died from doubt. In other words, the things that we think about affect our physical well-being. The things that we worry about typically fall into four different categories. Uh, the things which have already happened. In other words, the if-onlys. You know, if, if only I had been born in a different decade, or if only I had made that, that perfect grade on that one test, or if only I had uh, taken that job, or, or done, you know, maybe scored that touchdown, or whatever it might be, if only. And so we, we spend time worrying about, or fixated on, or thinking about things that happened way in the past, that we can't really change and really won't affect us in a positive way to think about. And so we spend time thinking, you know, if only, if only I could have done this, or if only I could have done that. The second category is things that, that may happen. We don't know for sure what the future holds, and, and so sometimes we fixate on things that we just simply don't know. They might happen or they might not. It's in God's hands, and certainly we can pray about those things, but what good or benefit does it do for us to worry about those things? In fact, if we look at that, that passage in Matthew in just a moment, we're going to see that, that God says, take it one day at a time. The third category is things that may never happen. There are things that might happen and things that might not ever happen. We could spend the, the rest of our lives, however long that may be, worried about a, a nuclear strike. But if no nuclear strike ever happened in our lifetime, would all of that worry have been effective? Would it have been for any point? We would have spent all that time wasted. And so sometimes we worry about things that, that may never happen. And we focus on, on all the doom and gloom around us, and yet it, it may be for nothing. And so let's focus on what we can affect and turn the rest over to God. And then the fourth category is things that will happen. Maybe you spend time worrying about death. There are a lot of people out there who have a great fear of death. Fear of public speaking, like I'm doing, uh, is number one. Death is number two. Many people are afraid of dying. But really, for a New Testament Christian, we should be able to see that, that death is merely the beginning. It's the shedding of this, this body, this husk this vessel, and it's a beginning of eternity for us. And if we're longing and looking forward to and hoping for our, our, an eager desire or expectation for heaven, then death is simply a beginning of something wonderful. Yes, we can, we can be sad about the idea of leaving loved ones or um, you know, making plans or preparations for death, a will, and, and setting money aside for others, and trying to take care of bills. Those are all good endeavors. But worrying about death, worrying about even the judgment, is futile. If you're worried about what God would say to you in the day of judgment, get right right now. Don't put it off till sometime later. Being anxious also, in a way, shows a lack of faith in God's ability to take care of us. And so when we think about him, there he says in, in verse 31 and 32, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? The Gentiles, they seek after these things. Gentiles, for that audience, would have been anyone who is an unbeliever. And so anyone outside the church, they worry about what our, our daily necessities. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? He doesn't say, you know, they, they worry about how big their house is or, or you know, how, how prestigious their name is. He says what they're going to eat and what they're going to drink and what they're going to wear. That's what the Gentiles do. Don't even worry about the essentials. God will take care of you. Now, we have to do our part. We have to work. If a man will not work, neither let him eat. But don't spend our time worrying, fixated over and and wondering, oh, no, you know, how, how am I going to get through this? With God's help, you can get through it. It may not be pleasant at times. It, it may be difficult, but God can see us through. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, 
I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say that the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. In fact, that's a uh, direct quote there in Hebrews 13 of what Jesus says there at, at the uh, Great Commission when he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. He's going to be with us. Certainly God cares for us. He's watching us. He, he, he knows what we have need of. He wants us to ask in faith. But he doesn't want us to spend time worrying about it. How much worry will uh, affect the, the politics of our nation today? Worrying about it won't change a thing. And so when we think about what God does for us, it changes us internally. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, beginning of verse 6, Be anxious or worry about nothing. How much, Paul? Nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension or understanding, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How much should we worry about? Paul says nothing. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all not some of your cares, casting all of your cares on him, for he cares for you. Isaiah chapter 23 and verse 6 says, You, God, speaking to God, you, God, will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is fixed on you because he trusts in you. When we trust God and the outcome that he's going to work in our life, it produces peace with us. I've given it over to someone who is bigger and better at handling problems than I am. Don't be anxious or worry because your Heavenly Father knows of your needs. As we said in Matthew 6.32, uh, notice he, he calls him your Heavenly Father. He doesn't call him God, but your Heavenly Father knows your needs. As a father, I have certain responsibilities toward my children. And I know really overall what their needs are going to be and I try to meet them. God views us as a father does and wants to help us. Said the robin to the sparrow, I would really like to know why these anxious human beings rush, and worry, uh, uh, rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, I think that it might be they, that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. I kind of botched that one there. But when we think about if birds could talk to one another, I think they would see, man, why do we humans spend so much time in futile thinking. God cares for us, just like those birds. And he's taking care of us in such a wonderful way that he would allow his son to die for us. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul says in verse 18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent me, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. God will supply our every need. He's taking care of us. And so don't borrow trouble. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Worrying about the future or the past, stay in today. In fact, uh, he says each day has enough trouble of its own. I would encourage you to view every day as a, a, a day-tight compartment. Leave yesterday in the past where it belongs. And don't be worrying so much about tomorrow, but focus on today in the here and now. Remember what Jesus said there in verse 33, the key to it all is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. God will supply our needs if we seek first his kingdom, the church. If we put him first in our lives, everything else works out. Let's have a prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. I know it's been a, a stressful day for many and a challenging uh, week and year and in the past year. And Father, I pray that you help us to have a forward focus of, uh, of truly looking to you and serving you and, and doing our very best to put all of our cares on you. You know the big picture. You know what's best for us. And, and Father, help us to trust in that, whether it be in good or in bad, that you know the big picture and that you're working it out for our advantage. 
Father, please help us as we fall short at times and we sin and stumble and, and do things that, that we shouldn't do. Help us to have a repentant attitude and to do our very best to truly turn away from that sin and turn to you and, and to take a new day and a new approach and to do our best not to give in to those sins or temptations. Father, I pray that you help us to sin less, to be more like you and to be truly thankful and grateful for what your son has done for us. Father, I know we're not promised tomorrow and, and we're not promised wealth or even security in life. But Lord, please forgive us when we take those things that you have given us for granted. Father, I pray that you bless us as a church, help us to grow, help us to grow spiritually, and may we be poured out in service to you. May we be exhausted in our service to you, and may we be humble in our successes. Father, please help us to grow in number, and may we be able to share the gospel with so many people around us that are hurting and, and dying in a lost condition. May we have hearts that are evangelistic and, and that we truly strive to live by your great commission. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.